I want to start actually by reading a poem um, by Czesław Miłosz, a poem translated by Bob Haas, a poem published by Dan and Echo Press long ago. It's called And Yet the Books. And yet the books will be there on the shelves, separate beings that appeared once, still wet as shining chestnuts under a tree in autumn, and touched, coddled, began to live in spite of fires on the horizon, castles blown up, tribes on the march, planets in motion. We are, they said, even as their pages were being torn out or a buzzing flame licked away their letters, so much more durable than we are, whose frail warmth cools down with memory, disperses, perishes. I imagine the earth when I am no more. Nothing happens, no loss. It's still a strange pageant, women's dresses, dewy lilacs, a song in the valley. Yet the books will be there on the shelves, well-born, derived from people, but also from radiance, heights. Uh, I read that because for me, Dan is, is synonymous with books of poetry, great books of poetry. Not that poems uh, themselves don't matter individually, but that the book can be such a powerful unit of organization in poems. Um, it would be hard to overstate the influence Dan has had on my own books of poetry since he's published seven of them. And the one he didn't publish is the one I wrote as a graduate student at Columbia when I was his student. Uh, I, I ended up as Dan's student at Columbia because of the impact of the books he was publishing. Um, when I was in college in the early 80s, you know, I would scour the bookstores in Chicago for the Echo Press books, uh, those of the American poets, those of the translations, the Europeans, just like incredibly eager to get my hands on a new one. The beauty of them as artifacts the uh, incredible intelligence of them individually, the sensibility that brought and combined so much great literature from so many places. This was in the same era when I realized uh, that I myself wanted to be a poet, which is the, the moment in the fairy tale when the family realizes it's fallen under the dreadful curse. Um, and then, as if to lift the curse, someone said, but there's something called an MFA program. You could go there and write poetry. Phenomenal information. I said, but unfortunately, you have to go to Iowa. I said, oh, OK, that's, that's going to be an issue. But luckily, under the influence of the Echo Press books, I, I came on a, on a strange configuration of information. Somebody named Daniel Halpern published all these Echo Press books. He edited the greatest magazine, literary magazine we've ever had, Antaeus. He was himself a remarkable poet. And he directed the MFA program at Columbia University, which immensely simplified the next stage of my uh, life, which was to move to New York in 1985 and immediately enroll in uh, Dan's workshop in my first semester. And then I took Dan. I couldn't take him in my second semester. You were forbidden from doing that. So I took him in my third semester again. I took him as often as I could and, and absorbed, as Janie Fink said, the incredible, uh, unbelievably astute and uh, completely infallible editorial sensibility he would direct towards one's own poems. I remember um, in, as I was nearing graduation, having to leave the magic enclave of the MFA program, talking with Dan about my own poems. I'd been writing uh, capitalist poems, poems that I think had a lot of youthful vigor, and poems I recall the late William Matthews once uh, describing as charming yet jejune. But Dan was a supporter of these poems, much to my great delight. Um, and I was talking with him about one. I said, yeah, but I'm going to have to stop writing those poems. And he said, you are? I said, well, yeah. He said, you are? I said, I, I think so. Don't I have to you know, grow up and write grown-up poems? He said, well, let me ask you a question. Do you, do you want to write more of those capitalist poems? I said, yes. He said, do, do you have more in you to write? I said, I think I do. And Dan gave me in two incredible pieces of advice kind of ruled into one. He said, well, if you have more, then it's your duty to write them. It's not actually a choice. It's your duty to do what the muse tells you to do. You can never second guess the muse. And also, it seems to me that you're maybe a poet with a project, a poet who's going to write 
books that uh, cohere, that are even book-length poems about Bob Hope. God forbid, at the time, we didn't know about that. <laughs> and I had no idea that that was the case. But it, it was certainly true, and it couldn't have been more helpful in shaping uh, my career, my vision, my understanding of myself as a poet. I don't want you to think that that was the last moment that Dan has really been a mentor to me, because it's really continued to the present day. Um, Ten years later, I was living in Chicago, and another traumatic moment arose in my life. I had to get a real job, which I had postponed as long as I could. But under the impetus of my wife and I having a child, it was finally time. And so I applied for academic jobs. Um, and I ran, I ran the information past Dan. I applied this place. They didn't want me. This place was vaguely interested. I said, and you know, I, I, I talked to some people at a place called Florida International University in Miami. But I, I'm not sure what to think about it. I didn't really have a lot of information. And Dan said, wait a minute, Florida International, I know that place. I've been down there. Uh, Les Stanford's there, Jim Hall. Those are, that's, a, that's a great program. And it's in Miami, which, first of all, Dan likes to visit very often. But secondly, it had Mitch Kaplan in it, who he said is the best bookstore guy in the country. He said, you should go to Miami. I, at that time, I, I, I had no idea. I basically took him on faith, signed on the dotted line, and I, I've been there 17 years. Um, and in fact, the, the one-year-old I moved there with is turning 18 and is going off to the University of Chicago in the fall to complete the cycle. He's going to come find Dan and start studying poetry with him. That would really be the moment in which the curse falls upon the family. <laughs> Let's hope. Uh, I, I want to read uh, one final poem, a poem that, uh, of my own. It's a new poem, a poem Dan hasn't published yet, um, which I want to dedicate to him, a poem called Books. Books live in the mind like honey inside a beehive, that ambrosial archive, each volume sealed in craft-made paper, nutritive cells, stamen fragrant, snug as apothecary jars. Like fossilized trilobites or skulls in a torch-lit catacomb beneath an ancient city, Byzantium or Ecbatana, or Paris at the end of April, when vendors set their folding tables filled with lily of the valley beside every metro entrance, and the women coming home from work or market, scented already with the fugitive perfume of Mouguette, carry handheld bouquets like pale tapers through the radiant, rain-washed streets at sunset. And then it is night, half the world ruled by dreams from which arise narrative forms, riddles, fables, myths, as mist lifts from mountain valleys in autumn, as steam belches from fumaroles in benthic trenches to whose sulfuric cones strange life forms cling, chrome green crabs and eyeless shrimp, soft-legged starfish sung to sleep by that curious cousin of the hippopotamus, the whale, who, having first evolved from ocean to land in the ever-eventful Cretaceous, thought better of it returning after millions of years to scholarly contemplation in the mesomorphic metaphysical library of the sea.